As we continue along with The Shape of Fear, we're diving into a movie that dared to break the mold of its predecessors. Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, takes us on a wild ride into a world of sinister masks and a chilling conspiracy. With no Michael Myers in sight, this film challenges what we thought we knew about the Halloween franchise. Grab your masks and join me as we uncover the mysteries and the madness behind this cult favorite on this episode of Ringside Review. Purely and simply evil. Welcome back to WWH. My name is Andrew Dreamer. As I said, today we're looking at Halloween 3 Season of the Witch, the one without Michael Myers. So, after John Carpenter was essentially forced under threat of a lawsuit to write a sequel to his original film, he did, but he sure wasn't happy about it. He wrote the script in two days while he drank beer the whole time and made sure to kill the shape at the end to ensure there would be no more Michael Myers. I think this letterboxed review from Carpenter pretty much sums up his feelings. Yeah, he doesn't like it. After this, he and Deborah Hill agreed to continue the franchise under one condition, anthology. They wanted to tell a new story centered around the Halloween season each year, and that is what gave us this film that I actually love. Halloween 3 Season of the Witch was released in 1982 and directed by Tommy Lee Wallace, who had also worked on the original film. Most notably, he is the man who turned the Captain Kirk mask into one of the most recognizable images in horror history. I also think his work on this movie is fantastic. Essentially, Season of the Witch tells the story of Dr. Dan Chalice, played by Tom Atkins, who teams up with a woman named Ellie Grimbridge to investigate her father's death in connection with a mask company getting ready for a deadly Halloween. The concept seems fairly simple, but believe me, there are so many twists and turns to this one. Before we get going, go ahead and like the video and let me know what your initial thoughts were about this movie. But it's about bell time now, so grab your popcorn and make your way to your seat. Let's head down to the ring for the plot. On October 23rd, 1982, in Northern California, Harry Grimbridge clutches a jack-o'-lantern Halloween mask while being pursued by mysterious men dressed in suits. In a desperate moment, he collapses at the shop of Walter Jones, who promptly calls for help. Harry is then transported to a hospital where he comes under the care of Dr. Daniel Chalice, an alcoholic doctor struggling with a strained relationship with his ex-wife and their two children. Later that night, Harry is murdered by another suited man who subsequently immolates himself in his car. Following the identification of her father's body, Harry's daughter Ellie meets with Dr. Chalice to discuss the suspicious circumstances surrounding Harry's death. The two decide to take matters into their own hands and set out on an investigation, traveling to Santamira, California, where the Silver Shamrock Novelties Factory is located. Silver Shamrock happens to be the maker of the Halloween mask that Harry was holding when he was attacked. As they check into a motel, Dr. Chalice discovers that Harry had previously stayed there, adding another layer of intrigue to their investigation. Now Dr. Dan and Ellie decide to take a break from their investigation to get a little intimate. And by a little intimate, I mean they fu- <laughs> By the way, don't forget to body slam that subscribe button so you never miss any of the heart-pounding, chill-inducing five-star matches we have here at WWH. We're not just wrestling with horror, we're delivering it to your screen every week. Marge Gutman, a fellow motel customer, finds a microchip hidden in the back of one of the mask's medallions. As she pokes at it with a hairpin, the medallion releases this energy beam into her mouth, leaving her face horribly disfigured. An insect also crawls out of her mouth. Soon after, men in lab coats arrive in a silver shamrock van to take Marge's body away. The next morning, Dr. Chalice overhears the factory technicians discussing a misfire with their boss, Connell Cochran. While Dr. Chalice and Ellie are touring the factory, Ellie discovers her father's car guarded by more suited men who prevent her from approaching. As they try to flee and call for help, Dr. Chalice realizes that no one outside the town can hear their calls. Ellie is then kidnapped and taken back to the factory. Dr. Chalice follows, only to be captured by the suited men who are revealed to be androids created by Connell Cochran. That's right, we have freaking robots in this movie too. Cochran then takes Dr. Chalice to the final process and control room where he unveils his sinister plan. 
Each mask contains a microchip embedded with a fragment of Stonehenge that he has somehow stolen. Yeah, don't think about it too much. As they watch the big giveaway commercial, the microchips on the masks are activated, leading to a horrifying outcome. The activation causes the wearers to suffer brain damage, and then a swarm of insects and snakes are released, attacking and killing anyone in close proximity. Keep in mind, they're watching this happen to a family. I mean, this family was there to take a tour of the factory, and then they get put in this room where the kid has on one of the masks. The commercial plays and the chip is activated, causing him and his parents to be killed. Connell Cochran might be the most evil person in the entire Halloween franchise. And that's saying a lot because Michael Myers is purely and simply evil. Cochran then locks Dr. Dan, who is wearing a mask in a room, and reveals his plan to revive ancient Celtic rituals by sacrificing children during Samhain, the pagan celebration marking the arrival of winter. And Cochran actually pronounces the word correctly, unlike Dr. Loomis. Samhain. Seizing the opportunity, Dr. Chalice manages to escape his bonds and rescues Ellie. Determined, he sneaks into the control room, activates the commercial on the screens, and pours a box of medallions from a ceiling rafter, resulting in mass casualties. The remnant of Stonehenge takes its toll on Connell Cochran, leading to his death while a massive fire engulfs the entire factory. It seems our heroes have saved the day and will get away. But as they drive away, Dr. Chalice is unexpectedly attacked by Ellie, who is revealed to be a robot. Has she always been a robot? Don't know. If not, when did she become a robot? Don't know. After a fierce struggle and a car crash, he destroys her. With urgency, he then flees on foot to Walter's shop, where he frantically contacts television networks in a desperate attempt to halt the commercial broadcast. He manages to succeed with two networks, but with the third, we just don't know. Despite his frantic pleas and shouting into the phone, the film ends before we see if they stop the broadcast or not. It's such an ambiguous ending, but the execution is absolutely perfect in my opinion. It's honestly one of my favorite movie endings of all time. Stop it! Stop it! On that note, I think it's time we dive into the positives of Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. So let's just keep talking about this ending. I absolutely love it. Either Dr. Chalice was successful in stopping this horrible evil, or he failed and millions of people will die. These are two polar opposite outcomes, and we get no answer. We're left with our own thoughts about the situation, and it's something that sticks with you for a long time. Tommy Lee Wallace truly showcased his directorial prowess in Halloween 3. While the film deviated from the traditional Michael Myers storyline, Wallace took bold creative risks that ultimately contributed to the film's unique identity. His ability to weave a captivating narrative filled with suspense and intrigue is commendable. Wallace created an eerie atmosphere that perfectly complemented the Halloween theme, utilizing the clever cinematography of Dean Cundey and atmospheric sound design to draw viewers into this unsettling world. And of course, you also have the phenomenal score by John Carpenter and Alan Howarth. Tom Atkins also delivered a remarkable performance as Dr. Dan Chalice, bringing depth and charisma to the character. Atkins' portrayal of the weary yet determined doctor was both engaging and pretty relatable at times. He effectively conveyed Dr. Chalice's internal struggles, balancing his personal issues with his relentless pursuit of truth amidst the chaos that is seemingly engulfing him right now. I also love that Carpenter, Hill, and everybody else involved with this film weren't afraid to swing for the fences. I mean, they went way out there for this story, and personally, I think it's amazing. It was a gutsy move that didn't really pay off at the time, but now most people tend to agree that this movie is actually really good. But why wasn't this movie well received when it first came out? Well, let's look at the negatives now and talk about it. Obviously, the biggest reason this movie didn't perform well was the fact that Michael Myers wasn't in the movie, other than the brief moment where the original Halloween is playing on a TV. There had already been two Halloween movies, each focusing on the shape. People loved the character and they wanted to see more. But deeper than that, I think it had a lot to do with the marketing of the film. Nobody really knew what to expect. They 
weren't clear about the shape not being in the movie. And of course, including Halloween in the title didn't really help either. Had they just called the film Season of the Witch, I think it would have fared a whole lot better. Or if they would have made this movie right after the original, I think people's expectations would have been tapered a little bit. Maybe the anthology thing could have worked in that scenario, but that's not the way it worked out. So my gripe really is with the marketing, not the lack of Michael Myers. I also think that the relationship between Dr. Chalice and Ellie is a bit weird. Sure, they're both consenting adults, but he's just so much older. And beyond that, they're literally investigating her father's death, but they sure ain't wasting any time getting into bed. A few other story elements are a bit weird too. For example, Stonehenge. Why does Stonehenge have magical powers? No idea, but it does. And how did Connell Cochran get his hands on it? Again, no idea. Then you have the robots or androids or whatever you want to call them. Why are they here and why did Cochran make them? Look, my point is there's some pretty out there stuff in this movie. In fact, it comes pretty close to being too much for me. Like really, really close. But I think that they came really near that line, but they didn't quite cross it. But that's really about all I have. And there you have it. That's going to wrap up this episode of Ringside Review. I hope you're enjoying this look at the Halloween franchise. It's been a lot of fun for me, and we still have plenty more to come. For now, though, just let me know down in the comments what you think about Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. Did you hate it at first and then come around later on, or have you always loved it? If you're interested in Redcon 1 products, I have a discount code that you can use to save 20% off of your entire order. Be sure to check that out. You can also find all of my merchandise available at ProWrestlingTees.com slash Andrew Dreamer or right under this video on the channel here. And I've also been working on the WWH Patreon page and updating some things over there. Be sure to check that out and consider joining us over there or you can even become a member here on YouTube. All of the links are down in the description below. Don't forget to like this video, share the video, and subscribe to the channel so you never miss any of the action here at WWH. Now that we've talked about Halloween 3, what are my favorite kills in the Halloween franchise? Luckily, you can find out right now by watching the video that's appearing on your screen. And remember, in the squared circle of horror, there are no countouts for nightmares. My name is Andrew Dreamer, and this is Wrestling With Horror.